At River Point, small groups are everything, and we want everybody to be in the small group. So if you're not in a small group, this is your time. So find one you like. We, we have small groups that are based on your neighborhood, or your gender, your marital status, your age, kids, no kids, married, single, all that. And we have one specifically designed I know that you'll love. Small groups are important because in every church, relationships is what matters. So making friends and having conversation is key to your growth and really feeling like you're part of this church. And so this is your time. We want you to do this. Find a small group, sign up for that small group, try that small group. That's it. Be part of this church. That's really River Point Church. It's in small groups. So try one. Well, I hope you're having a great time. Welcome to River Point. Welcome to West End. Are you excited about being here? Man, we're, ro we're rowdy today. Uh, I just want to say hi to all my friends out at Missouri City and uh, give you a push today. If you're at the Missouri City campus and uh, you have, uh, you're an able-bodied person, I want you to talk to Nathan about being on our road crew. Uh, we need you desperately there. And uh, we're on the final countdown, hoping to break, that, break ground on our building in a few months. So please go by and be part of the road crew today. And I want to say hi to, shout out to West End. I'm glad you're there. And on all of our campuses, if, you'll, if you're visiting with us, if you'll just fill out the welcome card. Y'all like my new sexy voice I'm developing? <laughs> I asked my wife, I said, Lisa, do you think, my, do you think my voice is sexy? She said, no, it feels like you're fixing to cough something up. And I said, well... <laughs> That's possible for sure. So anyway, I feel fine. I just sound terrible. So it's great. Well, I'm glad you're here. We always make a big deal of the Martin Luther King weekend on all of our campuses. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, Fort Bend County, uh, where our Missouri City campus and Richmond campus are located, is the most racially diverse county in the United States of America. We just surpassed uh, New York as a region. Houston as a region is that. In fact, you know, when we started this church, uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, they don't believe me, but really, I've been white most of my life. And, um, and, but we, God put us down here in a place where we had people from every walk of life and every background and every nation that came here. And I just couldn't figure out what we're doing, you know, how we could reach our community being so diverse. And uh, so I started uh, asking questions. I just realized very early I knew nothing. I grew up in an all-white neighborhood. I always had all-white friends. And, um, and, um, and I came from a family where my stepfather was just this uh, raging racist. I mean, just an amazing racist. And uh, to think that that didn't impact me or affect me or my thinking would be naive. So, you know, I had some stuff to overcome. And so I just started asking the question, you know, am I too white to be your pastor? And uh, in fact, I put a picket sign together. I think we have a photo of it. Put a picket sign together, and I went down to City Hall, and I just started asking people, do we have that picture? Maybe we don't have it. Oh, there it is. Am I too white to be your pastor? Because I knew I was too white to be a lot of people's pastor. I just wanted to know how white you got to be. And, um, <laughs> and this started a conversation really around the country. This got picked up by AP Press and some other agencies, and I started getting calls from all over the place. And really what started to happen is people of color started coming and trying us, especially when we started making a big deal, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the Martin Luther King weekend and the difference he made. What I realized from the very beginning, a place like Fort Bend County and Houston in general able, is able to experience a great sense of peace and solidarity and integration because we're standing on the shoulders of men and women who 50 years ago sacrificed so much and gave their very lives so that the laws of this country would be changed. And I'm grateful for that, and I hope you are too. And so I, I wanted to talk just this weekend as we continue our series, Things You Want, and here's the thing I know you want. I know the thing that you want in life is to love people well. I, want, I know the thing that you want. I don't know, that you, I don't know this about you, but I, I know this about me. I want to treat all people equally regardless of what they look like or where they come from. I want to be able to do that. Now, that's an intellectual thing that we can say that we do or we want to do. But, man, to do this really requires some introspection and some repentance. I mean, you've got to come before God in a powerful way to bring all your garbage and all your history and all your thoughts to God in order to be able to do this. So the thing that you really want in life is to love all people well. In fact, Jesus talked about 
quite frankly, talked about this idea that the way people would know that we belong to him and that we follow him is in the way that we treat each other. It's in the way that we love each other. And he wasn't talking about just the way that we love each other as Christians in a church. He talked about the idea of the way we love everybody. Now, Jesus was a champion of those people who were marginalized in their culture. He was for the widow and the orphan and the slave. I mean, he was, he was for everybody that culture deemed to be worthless or worth less than whoever the majority was at the time. And Jesus stood up and invited the outsider to come be part of the family of God. And, and so there's this idea here that Jesus is able to, this relationship that you and I say that we have with Christ, is able to allow us to rise above the cultural norms and be able to love well, which is something I know you want to do. I know you think you're great at loving people, but listen, let's be honest. We're really great at loving people who love us. And we're really great at loving people who are like us. It got quiet here in Richmond. I'm sure West End's shouting hallelujah and stuff in <laughs> Missouri City, but I mean, we are. I mean, I mean, when you're easy to love, I love you. I've been married 30 years, and I know for that 30 years I've been easy to love, but that's not true <laughs> about my wife. She's not been. <laughs> I was just telling her the other day, I can't believe you love me so much. And she said, well, I grew into it. And... Um, <laughs> I don't really know what that means. And so um, you know, it, it's this idea. Listen, I have four children, man. And um, when, they're, when they're cuddling up in your lap and reading, you're reading books to them, they're easy to love. But when they're um, being rebellious and doing things that only preacher's kids do, I'm sure they're hard to love. Uh, when people agree with you politically or agree with you in the way you look at life, they're easy to love. But when people disagree with you, and vote different than you, and look different than you, and from a different accent than you have, there may be a challenge to love. And yet God's calling us. Listen, here's the challenge I want you to leave with today. God's calling you in a way that your relationship with God would so be so powerful and so transforming in your life that you would love well, and that you would love the way God loves. This starts for me in the, in the book of Colossians. The Apostle Paul wrote to a very diverse church. So we're not, this isn't new. This idea of segregation, this idea of prejudice, this idea of hatred, it's not a new idea. This has been going for a long time, since man was created, in fact. And uh, there's always this uh, idea of gathering people in your people group, in your tribe, and waging war against others, right? So this isn't new. And the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians. And he addressed the idea of prejudice. And I want, to, I want to bring it to you today. It says this. He says, here, there's no Gentile or Jew. Here meaning in the church. Here meaning with God. Here meaning in the presence of God in a relationship with Jesus. Here meaning in this eternal world, in this heavenly economy, in this different place than the the place you grew up in, right? Here, you're in a different place. You're in a different world. And in this world, Paul says, there's no Jew or Gentile. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is in all as and is in all. Now, this is important. If you're going to love well and do the thing you want to do, which is to love all men equally, you're going to have to capture what Paul's talking about here, about your relationship with Jesus Christ, that Christ is in all and is in all. Now, let me just give you some background to these words here. Here the church was in the first century, and it had grown quite a bit in this region of Colossae, and it drew people from every walk of life. It reminds us of our church, man. We have people from every walk of life, just about every country. I mean, it's just, we do demographic studies. It's really just quite amazing what God's doing here. 
And so it was much like the church that you go to now here at River Point or even West End is starting to become more and more and more diverse. And so it's the idea that people are coming from every walk of life. And he mentions some groups of people, some big groups of people. Jew or Gentile is the first group. So that's, that's one. The other group is the Greek. The Greek people under Alexander the Great had really conquered much of the known world at this time. And the Greeks were the majority, and they were the powerful, and they had the wealth, and they hold it. If you weren't Greek, you weren't in, and you were a minority, and they hated the Jews. And the Jews hated them. The reason the Jews hated them is because the Greeks practiced a polytheism, and they had this moral darkness about them. And, and the Jews were very proud of that they were God's chosen people. And they carried this mark. Every Hebrew boy carried this mark of circumcision as a badge of honor. And it was an affront to everybody else. And he mentions these barbarians. The barbarians at the time were simply people who didn't speak Greeks, Greek. They didn't speak the language, so they must be uneducated. And because they're uneducated, they're stupid. And because they're stupid, they're barbarians. And then there's this special class of barbarian, the Scythians. They're the ones that were, they were like savages. Okay, the savages. And there's no slave, no free. And Paul's making this point. He took every popular group that you could think of in that church, and he said, let's acknowledge the differences here. There are some significant and severe differences. Everybody's coming into this building from a different place and with a different background. And much of that you could not choose for yourself. You had no vote in it. It just happened to you. And you brought it in here to the church. And it's starting to cause problems in the church. And that's why Paul, the apostle, addresses it in such clear way. He says, listen, ma'am, if we're going to be all that God wants us to be in our life, we're going to have to figure out how this relationship with Jesus Christ is going to allow us to overcome the cultural norms, the class system, and the caste system that the people bought into at that time was absolutely acceptable. There were certain people you ran around with, and there were certain people you didn't run around with. There are certain people you talked to, and there are certain people that you look down upon. Not much has changed. I don't know about you, but I get fearful when I see the news and think about places in, the, in our own country that are fragmented over race, and nobody's talking to anybody anymore. Everybody's just shooting um, hate messages and yelling messages, and nobody's sitting down and having a conversation anymore. And everybody's position's right in their own mind, and it's causing this great division. And as thankful and as grateful as I am for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Thurgood Marshall and all these great civil rights heroes who changed our laws, they changed the way our country legally sees people. And now it's time for the church to stand up and rise up in a way that allows us to allow all people to be seen. All people matter to God. What Paul was talking about here is that Jesus Christ is all that pulls us all together. It's the thing that we have in common. And he is in all that every single one of us, just like in the first century, were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. So just remember this. When you're thinking those thoughts about that other group of people, you're thinking those thoughts against the image of God. When you're talking that hate talk and that prejudicial thing, that evil, dark thing in your heart, and I've said it, and I've thought it, and I've felt it. When you do that, just like when I do that, we're doing that against people that are made in the image of God. Not only that, when we speak against one another, we're speaking against somebody that God loves as much as he loves you. I know that's hard to believe. Because what happens with segregation and what happens with these prejudices, we put ourselves in a group that thinks we're the best, thinks that we're the, we're the most beloved, that we're the most treasured, 
So everybody else is less valuable. And Paul is saying in this Colossian passage, that's not true. There are those, those, those divisions don't exist in heaven. Those divisions don't exist with God. He sees us, this is bad news for some of you. He sees us all the same. He loves us all the same. So when you and I are shouting it about other people or talking bad about other people, even people who don't believe in God or accept this idea of Jesus as their Savior, when we do that, we're talking against people who God loves. Is anybody, let me ask you this. Has anybody ever said something about somebody you loved in your presence? That, even, if it, even if what they said was true, how'd that make you feel? I mean... You can, you can talk about me all you want. You start talking about my mama. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have some trouble. You know, I don't let you talk about my wife. I don't let you talk about my brother. I don't let you talk about my niece or my nephew like that. I don't let you talk about my children. And don't you even say something bad about my grandson. Because in the name of the Lord, <laughs> I will whip you. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter to me what you're saying is true or not true. See, we always think we have the truth, don't we? What matters is they are beloved. And they have dignity that, we, that God's bestowed upon them that we should agree with. That even if they don't look like us or come from where we come from or act like we act or share our values, they are equal before the living God. And we have a choice to make in our life as to whether we're going to agree with God or not agree with God. So God's truth is this. All men are created equal. All men are created in his image. And we as a church have to figure out how to see other people the way God sees them, in order to love them the way God loves them. And if we can't do that, then we're going to continue to divide. We're going to continue to, sh to shout at each other. We're going to continue to throw rocks at each other. And I'm going to tell you something, man. That's going to just be awful, awful, awful. River Point and West End, the churches here, the Missouri City campus, we have an opportunity like none other. Because in a country that's fractured and divided and still prejudicial, we are showing the world it can be done. We're in the top 1% of all churches in America that are integrated, that, have, that don't have a vast majority, that we have people from every walk of life, and it is uncomfortable at times, isn't it? Because if you came from a high church background, and you come in here and you sit down, and we start that crazy worship music, and you're Catholic, here's what God does. I don't know why he does this. He does it every time. On all three campuses I've seen this year, this sweet little Catholic girl sitting down next to a crazy charismatic. And she's about to pull her tambourine out of her purse. And the Catholic girl doesn't know what to do about that. I mean, it's just like, oh, it's strange. I mean, it's that, that's good. And, and the and, and the Catholic is saying, what is wrong with that girl? And the charismatic is saying, what is wrong with that girl? And, I mean, it's, it's that, why can't you be more like me? And so a church like us gives us an opportunity to sit, not just in a worship experience, but in a small group or in a Bible study or around the table or over coffee or eating a hamburger together where we can listen to each other, where we can appreciate where we've come from, where we can learn, learn. Learn about what God's done in somebody's life. You know, this, that's, that's where it is. And so this comes down to me as an issue of obedience for the church. Are you going to obey God when it comes to loving others well? Even people who don't love you, even people who don't agree with you, even people who don't look like you. Are you going to love well? This is about obedience. This is about you 
believing God's word is true. Because this is the only way you're going to rise above the cultural norms that segregate us and separate us. At your work, or in your school, or in your neighborhood. And the only way you're going to rise above that and walk across the street and introduce yourself to that new neighbor who doesn't look like you is because you love Jesus and you know Jesus loves that person and you want to get to know him. My God, bring him a pie. Do something nice for him, you know? In the name of God, reach out. Cut their grass. I'll tell you where I live. Come cut mine. I mean, really. <laughs> Do something amazing in the name of God. Don't wait for them to do something for you. You go out in Jesus' name and do something amazing. This is, this is where our religion isn't just lip service anymore. This is where it really becomes a difference maker in our world. And you don't fit in anymore to a culture that hates and to a culture that divides and a cu culture that has prejudice because you belong to God. And God bought you with a price. And because he did that, you love him. And because you love him, you're going to change and begin to love other people well. There's this next verse of scripture. Let me tell you, show you what it is. It says, he has told you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So this is the idea that we're walking humbly with God. To we're going to stand up for justice. We're going, to, we're going to fight for people who don't have equal opportunity in this culture, even if we don't know who they are, even if we don't know their names. We're going to fight for the marginalized because God has asked us to walk humbly with him. And listen, not everybody in this world gets a fair shake and it's up to the God lovers, the Christ followers, that says, listen, man, we're going to stand up for this person. We're going to stand up in the margin, in the gap, and make a difference. And God's going to change our vision. And God's going to change our thinking. I love that idea. Here's the other idea about obedience. Here's the next passage of Scripture. It says, people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me. God's not pleased with our songs. Teaching as doctrine the precepts of men. In this passage here, their heart is far from me. It's only lip service. This loving other people, I'm going to tell you something as your pastor. This loving other people well, all other people well, is a serious business to God. This is a serious idea. And the one thing that God wants from you is a follower of his is obedience. That's the bigger issue than prejudice or segregation or all these other things. The biggest idea is I'm not being obedient to God. Listen, I wasn't there, but 50 years ago, the church of Jesus Christ, the Christian church, was way too silent, way too long. And it was men and women like Martin Luther King who stood up and said, no longer. We cannot live like this. This isn't right. This doesn't honor God. Because of their Christian conviction, they risked their life and gave their life to make this country better. And we too can no longer sit in the shadows of our culture where we listen as bystanders to the hate and what's going on. We have to go and do something about this by forging new friendships and walking in a direction that honors God. To not give lip service that all men are created equal, but to actually act like it. To, to actually extend the hand of fellowship. You know, one of the reasons we think you ought to be in a small group at, at West End or here at River Point or in the Missouri City campus is because here's what we know. You're going to be sitting in a room once a week with people who are not like you. I don't know if you thought about this or not, but diversity was not an accident by God. God did not make us all the same on purpose. We need each other. We need desperately to be able to sit down in a room with the Bible involved somewhere to where we can listen and hear and understand. It doesn't mean we agree. This is one thing that the, 
This just drove me crazy. If I disagree with you, now I hate you. And that's stupid. I disagree with everybody in my family, and I love them all. I don't like to be with them all the time, but, you know, this is the idea. I can speak my mind. I don't agree with that, but I love you anyway. Oh, well, this is you. And people try to put me in a box. Well, if you don't do this, then you're just as bad as somebody else. And I'm going, man, I'm old and fat. Get out of my hair, man. Just really, that's just stupid. That's just stupid. That's manipulative. But when I sit down with somebody from a different place, and their skin's a different color, and we have a conversation about Jesus, it's powerful what God teaches me. It's one reason I like going to Cuba, because I don't even understand the language, but through a translator, God is the same. God is the same. And I'm so encouraged by these people's faith. You know, and I'm just, I don't want to be religious. I don't want to hold on to this form of godliness. I I really want to execute this idea of loving people well. And it's not easy to do. Paul said it in a different way in Timothy. He said this way. He said, holding to a form of godliness, these people, although they have denied its power, Avoid people like that, that are religious. Avoid people. Jesus had the most problem with religious people. So avoid that, the kind of person that just have this lip service and that have no power. The power that Paul's talking about is to not get sucked into the culture's way of doing life, but to follow Jesus in such a powerful way that you love all men equally and treat them Equally, and it starts in our hearts and it ends up in our heads and eventually becomes a behavior. Paul says it this way in Corinthians He says, And every proud thing that rises itself against the knowledge of God, this truth that all men are created equal, this truth that God has created every one of us in His image, anything that rises up against that knowledge, then we're going to take capture every one of those thoughts and give it up and obey. Christ. We're going to obey Christ. We really are going to obey Christ in this. We're going to ask God to search our hearts. We're going to ask God to do something in our lives. One of the many blessings that I've had here, I, I, I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk today, that my stepfather was just a, the biggest racist. He worked in the prison system, and golly, just, he, he, I didn't realize it until later in life, but um, he's since passed, and we, we talked about it some, but it's just like, I wonder how that affected me, and I could just see these things that just came up into my life, in my heart, that really was the sound of my stepfather in my head as I looked at people of different color. And, it, and I didn't say much, but I thought it. And then I became a pastor here, and God started bringing beautiful people from every walk of life into my life and teaching me so much. I'm so grateful for people that have come into my life and have been patient with me. And I've told people, listen, man, I didn't grow up in a black church or an Hispanic church or an Asian church. So I'm going to say something insensitive and stupid. It doesn't mean I'm a racist. It just means I'm insensitive and stupid, and I need... I need somebody to educate me. So if you love me, put your arm around me. Put your arm around me and tell me what I said was insensitive or perceived as insensitive and stupid. And I will repent. And I can't tell you how how less that's happening these days. And how grateful I am for the men and women who have walked up to me in a very respectful way and said... I don't think you meant what I heard. I go, I don't even know what I said, so help me. I'm so grateful for our advisory team that's made up of people from every walk of life. I'm so grateful that when somebody from a different background says something, it has weight with me because God's teaching me how to love everybody the same and that my perspective isn't the total perspective. Listen, if you want to grow in your relationship with Christ, you don't want a bunch of people around you that agree with you. 
You want people around you that challenge you in love. And you're going to have to figure out how to get your life in obedience with God's word, what God's word says when it comes to loving other people. This is the biggest challenge we got. I know this is what you want, but it's very difficult to do. But here's what I believe the payoff is for us. One is we'll grow faster and deeper in our relationship with the creator. And we'll get to enjoy this great diversity in our church. I'm especially praying for West End because inside the loop, the segregation in churches is really significant and severe. And so I'm praying, West End, that you will catch a hold of this idea that all people are welcome at our church. And we want all people from all backgrounds to come and explore a relationship with Christ. It's very difficult to do inside the loop in Houston. I don't know why that is, but it, it really is. And I'm really excited that we get the payoff for us is that we get to spend our lives here. Listen, if you don't like diversity, you're going to hate heaven. I mean, really, you just, you're going to hate it. It's not like you go to, through the pearly gates. Hey, where are the white people hanging out? I want to go hang out with the white people. You know, like, I mean, it's just not going to happen. So let's get used to it. Let's learn from one another. Let's love each other well. And let's take it outside the walls of these churches that we call our home. And let's start loving people in our community. And let's not fight hate with hate. It's exhausting. Let's not try to outshout somebody. Let's sit down with them and have a coffee and a conversation about what life's doing. Not everybody's going to be interested in that. I get it. But let's not join the hate. Let's not join the parade of people that are throwing stuff, trying to get your attention and trying to put us in a box that says, if we don't do this or don't agree with this or don't vote this way, then we don't believe this. Let's just be ourselves and let the love of Christ flow out of our lives into our community and let's heal this world. I just think we have an opportunity as a church, as we pull together and love people well, to make some healing happen and, and bring people together in a powerful way that's joyful. That all of a sudden it's the way God wanted it to be. And it was what Dr. King dreamed of 50 years ago when he was talking about Christians coming together and being part of the same church family. What we're getting to experience is because people gave their life for what we get to do today. And I'm so grateful for it. And I'm just praying that we can love each other well. And that we can love each other the way God loves us. And that we can treat all people with dignity that they deserve. And that we can love them with the love of Christ. I think it will make a huge difference in our lives. So take a look inside your heart this week. You're going to have an opportunity tomorrow when you go to work. You're going to have this opportunity to look at life differently. When you go to your school, when you're in your neighborhood event or your social setting, see what God won't do in your life. And I pray that God would be honored and people would come to believe in Jesus because we loved that well. Let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much that you love us all the same and that we're all special to you. And just like in the first century, our culture today marginalizes those people that they deem to be less valuable. And we just confess the sin of prejudice that runs not just in our culture, but in our hearts at times. The way we look down at other people because we're so insecure, we're trying to provide ourselves with a sense of value by devaluing other human life. May we not do this anymore. May, may we get so gripped with the love of Jesus that it would allow us to rise above the way this world treats each the people in this culture and then we rise above the norms and the prejudice and the segregation and the hate May we learn to love each other in a way that brings honor to Jesus and lifts up all men and all women equally before you. Would you challenge us in our own relationships 
that we need people that are much different than us to be in our world. May we walk away from sameness and embrace differences without compromising your truth. May we be obedient to your word and may we change radically so we can bring healing to our land. We need that desperately. May our church be an example of what grace and compassion and mercy and love can do to a place. Would you cause us to be an example of your great unconditional love? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.